Hello, I am Leslie Sloss, and welcome to the short introduction to the subject of coal mine reclamation, as covered in my new report for the Clean Coal Centre. Now, the report itself actually encompasses a wide range of issues, including some quite technical information, so I've opted to present some of the more interesting data here, and also the prettiest and most enjoyable of the pictures from the report. However, the report itself contains much more detail um, and more issues, and so if any of the points discussed today interest you, please do take a closer look at the report itself. There will be time at the end of the talk, or even during the talk, if you're good at multitasking, to ask me questions via the online system on your screen, and I will do my best to answer these all at the end of the talk. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, first I'm going to cover the legislation which is relevant to mining and mine reclamation, but more importantly I'm going to look at how mining operations should consider their effects on the local environment and how best to minimise potential damage. This includes making sure that mining does not contaminate local water courses and that indigenous plants and animals are protected. We're evolving into a society where people respect and treasure places of untouched natural beauty, and so mining companies must respect also the views of the local community whose lives could be affected by changes in their surrounding scenery. And of course, once the coal is removed and the mine closed down, there must be some guarantee that the site left behind is fit for some useful purpose, even if that purpose is merely to provide a home for wildflowers and rabbits. Even wildflowers and rabbits have the right to a safe environment. Now, the lifetime of a mine is very much more than just the period of the mine operations themselves. The mine starts as a proposal, and the gestation period between the submission of a proposal and the granting of a permit to proceed can be anything from months to years. And then, then the mine itself will last anywhere from 2 to 100 years, depending how much coal and lignite is available to be removed. And then there will be the wind-up of activities and the clearing of the site. And then afterwards, some indefinite period whereby the land will return to some sort of um, equilibrium or, or solid state, as it were. The impacts of mining can be significant. This diagram shows the potential effects of surface mining, uh, although the impacts from deep mining are generally lower because you disturb less of the surface soil and ecosystems. There are many relevant points that relate to both surface and deep mining. And quite a few issues are affected here. Impacts varying from potential contamination, disruption of plants and animals, and degradation of soils to disruption of local communities and activities. And each of these must be considered and minimised via a plan which must be determined before even the first truckload of topsoil is removed. Now these days in most developed countries, mining activities will not be permitted unless the proposal includes details of how the site will be remediated following mine closure. In many cases, permits will not be given and monetary bonds or guarantees which must be paid in advance will not be released unless the closure plan is completed to everyone's satisfaction. But this has certainly not always been the case. It's not uncommon for the word coal mining to evoke negative reactions, and this is largely due to the reporting of the worst examples of mining activities from history. It seems that the human brain finds it easier to remember the bad stuff rather than the good stuff. But that's not to say that mining has not caused significant damage. It certainly has. There are over 560,000 abandoned mines in the USA alone. Um, plenty more in Germany, China, South America, and so on. And some of these are definitely not sites of natural beauty. Now, the top left picture here shows a mine during the final days of production. And in the past, it would have been conceivable for this site to be merely bulldozed to level off the land and then abandoned with perhaps some grass seeds and trees plonked on top. Top right shows the typical ochre or orangey colour of acid mine drainage um, with severe pollution condition, which we're going to discuss more later. The bottom left picture shows what happens when a mine site is not backfilled correctly and you get land subsidence. And in fact, um, opposite my home in Fife, where I'm sitting at the moment, there is a children's open play park area. However, about 30 or 40 years ago, it was the site of two semi-detached houses. However, they eventually leaned so far to the right that they were condemned and removed. And this was all genuinely due to substance associated with mining in the area. The final picture on the right shows numerous large potholes from mine subsidence. And it's not only ugly, but obviously dangerous. There's at least one plot line from a Lassie movie that's involved a small boy disappearing down a collapsed mine shaft. And so it's not surprising 
that <coughs> excuse me that there's now a mountain of legislation to be climbed before the first shovel hits the topsoil. And initially these are going to be general permits and licenses relevant to the resources in the land to say that you're entitled to dig in that soil and to remove the, the coal and lignite underneath. But then there are plenty of environmental laws and regulations um, dealing with different areas and environment, everything from water, uh, soil through to emissions, safety and obviously um, the, the safety of any species in the area, especially endangered species. And even once the permit has been drafted and all the regulations taken into account, Many mining proposals then face a public review where the local community can have the chance to view and if they desire, oppose. The power of the local community to nip a project in the bud at the last stage should not be underestimated and it may explain why many new projects include more ambitious and perhaps beautiful or, or um, ambitious closure plans and we're going to discuss those more later with some very nice examples. One of the first considerations before um, mining is how the mining activities are going to affect the water. Now mining should as much as possible avoid disrupting local rivers and lakes but if it's necessary then barriers should be created to ensure that polluted water from the mine doesn't enter the water course. But this is not always as easy as it seems. Even rain water falling onto a coal mine or onto coal heaps can lead to runoff and contaminated water over land and via groundwater underneath. Even something as apparently unrelated as removing trees from around the site, changing the, the road system into the, the operations facilities, can significantly change the way the water moves through the soil. And any flow of water downhill will vary with the plants and soils and bumps and so on that it meets along the way. Any change of this will affect the water flow. Some of this can be modelled in advance. Um, the rest will need to be evaluated as part of an ongoing monitoring programme throughout the operation of the mine. This diagram shows the framework for predicting and managing water quality impacts from mining. On the left there we have a flow chart which helps the operator determine whether the effects of the local water courses can be minimised by simply avoiding areas of concern or whether active treatment systems are going to have to be installed. And then on the right there is a step-by-step -step guide to um, looking at the, the water, soil and rock samplings that will be acquired before any permit is granted. The aim is not simply to make sure that the water being returned to the local system is clean, but it's also suitable for the local ecosystem. You've got to remember that some streams are naturally briny or full of clay or even what we would regard as dirty, but the plants and animals that are in there have grown up to suit that environment. And so even putting ultra-clean water back into a water course can cause just as much damage as putting in dirty water to a, a more clean system, if you see what I mean. You have to suit the discharge to suit the environment. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, of course, we have the worst case scenarios, and that is the acid mine drainage, or AMD as it's called. Um, put simply, when we dig up coal and lignite, you release um, materials that have not been exposed to water or air for literally millennia. These are fossil fuels. And so sometimes you get some really severe reactions happening. It tends to be the iron sulfate, that's the, S, the, sorry, the FES2 on the left here. As soon as it's exposed to oxygen and water, then you get release of the iron ions and some fairly strong sulfuric acid. You then get a sort of in feedback loop whereby more acid and more iron ions cause more release of more acid and more iron ions. And so in practice, you end up with an almighty mucky mess that is acid mine drainage, this horrible ochre colour. Um, this causes further damage because the severe acidity of the water can cause the release of heavy metals and other toxic elements from surrounding soils and rocks to add more pollution into the water system. And it's not surprising to note that not much can live in this kind of water. What we actually see here is a US EPA site in America where the mine water is being drained into this dam system which is clearly lined by plastics and so on and that will be treated before any of the water is released back into the natural watercourse system. This obviously shows a, a pretty extreme case but even mild acidification can take, make a habitat unsuitable for some fish and plants. It's been suggested that there are over 1.1 million surface acres, that's four 1,450 kilometres square in real money of abandoned mine sites in the USA alone and there are over 9,000 miles of polluted streams as a result of that. 
That's not to say this is unique to the USA, absolutely not. There's acid mine drainage problems in the Zvika region of Germany, in Poland, in China, and anywhere where there is a long history of mining, mining that's taken place before any of these environmental considerations really came into play. Now, open cast mines can actually result in acid mine drainage, which has lower pHs, that is a stronger acid, than underground mines, although this is on a case-by-case -case basis based on really what you have in your soils and so on. Now, treating acid mine drainage, there are two main options. There is your active treatment and your passive treatment. Active treatment is commonly used during the operation of the mine or during the initial cleanup phase. And this is where water being released from the operations and any water that's been collected in the ponds and dams can be treated before it's released. And it's commonly done quite basically with an alkaline that's going to neutralize the acid that's there. You can also have additional filters or even bacterial treatments that are going to remove the iron and the other toxic, trace, potentially toxic elements that are in there. If there's concern that there will be further leakage of acidity once you've moved away from the site, you can backfill the area or surround it with limestone to treat the water as it osmoses over time. And in some situations, FTD gypsum, flue gas desulfurization gypsum that you've collected from a coal combustion plant during your sulfur control, and fly ash from your combustion systems can actually be used as these alkaline materials to act as backfill in these areas, which kind of nicely closes the coal chain loop so that the hole you've dug out to obtain your coal and lignite can be refilled with the ash and the gypsum that's left over from after combusting it. Closes the loop, the, the loop nicely, I feel. For longer term treatment, that means when you close a mine and you then plan to leave and never come back, there are passive treatments which take advantage of natural rocks and added in liming materials and specially selected plants and even bacteria can be put into these systems, usually a series of ponds that will treat any further water draining from the mine through these systems naturally to, to create a sort of buffering before it enters the environment. And these systems are designed to be self-sustaining if you look more closely at an example of a, an acid mine treatment system at the Optimum Mine in South Africa, this system takes in water from the dams at the site and uses numerous cleaning systems that are quite advanced, clarification, filtration, anti-scaling, precipitation, osmosis and reverse osmosis, all sorts of chemistry going on there. And this results in two main waste streams, the sludge stream, which is eventually dried out, and the, the sludge is taken away and disposed with the mining waste in a landfill somewhere, and a brine stream. This will allow for evaporation of clean water from that and the collection of sludge, or even the, the movement of this water back into the system at the top of the loop there. Now, as you can imagine, South Africa can suffer from significant water shortages. And so this mine is actually looking to further improve the system to make the water produced portable and suitable to add into the water uh, supply of the local drinking water supply. This approach is already underway at the E-Malaheni region of South Africa, where Anglo-America processed the wastewater from the Whitbank coal mine area to supply clean water to the local municipality, and thus leaving a benefit to the local community. Now, the inevitable outcome of both surface and deep mining is a great big hole in the ground. That's just what happens when you take stuff out. And in many cases, without treatment, great big holes in the ground get flooded. In many cases, this will be unavoidable, and the best the operator can do is treat the site to limit any negative effects, such as the acid mine drainage problem. Now, this figure shows the dramatic increase in water features, features or water areas in the Lusatia region of Germany, as a result of the extensive mining in, in the region over the past couple of decades. Here we can see that forestry um, before and after mining has stayed pretty much the same there in that green at the bottom, but the agriculture has actually come down and the amount of water in the region has gone up. Now this is not necessarily a bad thing, it's just a change in land use. In fact, these um, new water areas are plenty of new lakes with fishing and wildlife in place. They're considered as areas of natural beauty. Some have been marketed as marinas and water parks for boating and water skiing. So it's not necessarily a loss of agriculture. It's a creation of new leisure and fishing facilities, a change of use as you were. Moving on to land, as again, if you dig a big hole in the ground to get coal out, then you're left with a big hole in the ground and a, certainly a change in the landscape. Um, 
reclamation plans are going to have to consider how these changes will affect the local ecosystems. Even the removal of a hill or a change in the way the slope um, faces into the wind will change the wind, way the wind blows across the landscape and the way water will flow down. And so even if you level off an area or try to return it back to its original landform, you're going to get some plants and animals that were there before that are not going to like the changes that you've made. And so botanists or biologists are usually involved during mine closures to sample the soil, to study the environment and the changes that happened in the climate. And our chosen are going to select plant species and animal species that are not going to blow away or be washed away during the first blustery or stormy weekend. This next slide shows the, the areas in North America, in Kentucky and Tennessee and so on, and these are areas where there's been significant coal mining and where the shape of the land has changed quite significantly. In some cases, you were talking about backfilling and, and filling big holes or levelling off soils. But on the left here, you can see a mine that has been on the side of an extremely steep hill, um, probably made steeper by the removal of the coal of the lignite in this area. And it's not a site that you can naturally turn into a, a, a park or a water feature or anything, but you can certainly make it more stable, more safe by putting in those layers there, and you can make it a little bit more nicer to look at, as it were. I'm not sure whether they managed to farm or uh, collect the grass from this region, but they've certainly left it safer and prettier than it was in the past. Uh, unfortunately, this has not always been the case, and in the past there have been issues where um, mines have not been left safe. Here we can see what happens when loose materials such as soil heaps and uh, relocated topsoil become unstable. Um, we have a, a, an incident at Lyburn in the USA where this, at the top of the hill there, there was a, a collection of topsoil and um, coal waste materials um, which was unsettled during a storm and rain and washed down the side of that hill and caused significant damage to the local community. This is a, a physical condition known as thixotropy, or thixotropy, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it properly, where something that's assumed to be a solid suddenly and unexpectedly becomes a liquid. Um, usually we associate this more with tomato ketchup, which will pretend to be a solid until it's no longer a solid and it's all over your clothes. This can happen with coal and soil waste heaps. Now this type of incident shown here obviously um, was, is down to mismanagement and there are several ways of making sure this doesn't happen by sealing off um, spoil heaps and so on, putting dams around them um, and even temporarily letting plants and weeds grow on the stockpiles. The roots from the plants will provide drainage and will also provide stability with the root system holding the pile together. This is obviously the more uh, long-term option of building dams to control the whole area. Here we see um, a site that used to be um, an, a, an open cast mine, um, but it has been filled. The area on the right has been allowed to turn into a, a lake, um, and the, the, the area on the left has been used to store the tip of the refuse from the mine. And to ensure that the tip does not run down into the lake, as it were, there's this hidden dam in the middle there that will be built of extremely solid concrete type material. And the longer that that is there, the longer the tip will have uh, the chance to become more solid and settled over time. Um, it will also probably be being, being treated with alkaline materials to ensure that there's no acid mine drainage into that new lake. Now doing all these kind of things to remediate the land is obviously expensive. And in the past, it wasn't unusual for people to simply up and leave and forget about the whole thing because it was too costly. And to avoid that now, there are things called bonds. And as you put your permit in, you must also set aside the amount of money that you think or estimate it will cost to get that site back to um, a valuable use or a safe area at least. And that the bond will only be released back to you once the site is completed as planned. And this means that if the company goes bust, the money is still there and somebody else can take over to remediate the, the, the land. Now you can make savings on this by reusing material, recycling the materials. We mentioned the FGD waste and the fly ash for your power plant can be used as backfill materials. And you can also use them to help with the AMD, the acid mine drainage problem. The acid mine drainage can be one of the most costly things, um, up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the site. However, you can reduce your cost significantly if you find a new use for the land and almost sell it in advance, if you like. The most economic or the most beneficial uses of um, pre-mined land will be for industry and housing and public buildings. However, to get land that is suitable for that, you're obviously meeting minimum performance standards and 
in terms of, of being a level surface as being safe and secure and sound. Um, slightly less predict to expensive would be a uses such as cultivation or grazing, where you're levelling off the land, you're replacing topsoil, and you're letting plants and animals re-establish, or perhaps turning it into some sort of rural cramp site or so on for fishing or forestry. The benefit for that is that you're suddenly moving into an area that wasn't being used before. Um, it's quite often that mines um, are quite remote, and so new roads and infrastructure are being put in to get the, the mining equipment in and the coal and the lignite out. And so new roads then mean that this is new area for the public to use that wasn't accessible to them before. There are also community uses such as open spaces, country parks and nature conservancy. And there's a lot of good examples of those kind of things in the report if you want to take a better look at that. Here's an example, some pretty pictures at the end now. Um, of a mine in Queensland, Australia, where um, the rehabilitation was actually quite simple. Um, what they do is clear the area, they leveled it off. They put in usually about a metre or so of new topsoil into an area to ensure that it's, uh, it's viable for growing plants or sustaining animals. And so here we can see some grassland which will be used either for grazing or to collect um, materials to feed animals off-site. This is what sort of uh, uh, shouldn't have happened but did and worked really well was at, um, the Hunerwasser coal mine in Germany where they decided that they would r return it to a minimum level of safety uh, put a layer of clay on the top but then they would leave it and see what happened they weren't going to invest in putting the right plants and animals in there they would just see what happened and it actually worked out really well um, with natural wildflowers and so on coming in there and wildlife returning and this lazy fair attitude may work very well here and there, but it certainly should not be assumed for all sites. And the Germans did not, certainly didn't turn around and walk away from this. They have been keeping a close eye on it to make sure that it is as safe and sound and, and uh, in its own little equilibrium of safety, as it were. And then there are the opposite ends of the spectrum where we see people investing significant amounts of time and money in making sites more beautiful. Here we have the Northumberlandia. Um, as you can see, she's quite a stunning human landform, a sculpture of a lady declining. She's in Northumberland, north of Newcastle. She's made of one and a half million tonnes of rock, clay and soil, which has been removed from the coal mine next door. She's about 100 feet high and a quarter of a mile long. She's intended to be a living part of the countryside that's going to mature over time with plants and weeds um, forming on her. And she's going to be left in that kind of um, a lazy fair attitude, to use that word again. She's a public park, and so the public can come in and walk all over her. And if you stand on her head there, you can see um, up and at the top of the building, that's where the shot and coal mine um, is still operational. And so if you're like me and you love watching big mining equipment in operation, you can stand there and admire the, the beauty of the coal mine next door. And this is all part of what's known as Restoration First, which um, is run by the Banks Group, and it's an approach to showing that they can clean up the area even while the coal mine next door is operation, and th the trust is there that they will also clean up the coal mine once that's complete. It's cost £3 million to set up, funded by the Banks Group and the Blagden Estate, which owns the local land. Um, if you do get a chance to go and see her, I would recommend it. And if you're in the UK and listening right now, I would really recommend you go and see her this weekend because I'm assured that as part of the UK Red Nose Day charity celebrations, she will be wearing a red nose this weekend, which I should imagine be quite fun to see. Um, this site and design was by Charles Jenks, who's a, a renowned land artist, and he's also designed this site for the Scottish School site in, in Fife in Scotland, where I live, and the St Ninian's Open Cast site. Um, it's sort of half closed. The mine is kind of closing down and moving northwards, as it were, and so some of the land has already taken up some of this form, and the rest of it will form over time. It's called the Fife Earth Project, and it's supposed to represent Scotland's contribution to global politics, science, and the social and development of the planet, as it were. And if you look there, sort of um, in the middle to bottom, there's a little relief map of Scotland that will be cut out into a land, uh, a flat land area. And sort of above that, there's a larger water feature and a little relief map of Scotland in there. There are swirly bits of land and steep hills, pyramid areas. 
there are uh, sculptures, there are pieces of mining equipment there, there's forest areas. It's supposed to be quite impressive and it will eventually cover 665 acres and be a huge tourist attraction in the area. Um, on the right there, sweeping up there, I think is the M9, which I drive up. And I can tell you that some of the swirly bits and the triangular area are certainly taking shape and are very attractive uh, to look at from the motorway, whereas the, the topmost area is not complete yet at all. You can still see mining going on. And in the top um, area of the map there, there's also a little area where there's a lovely little coffee shop and a craft shop. So I really do think this will be a benefit to the local community to have people coming up to see this area of natural beauty that has come out of what was once a sort of blot in the landscape. And this is the artist's image of what it's actually going to look like. As I say, those swirly bits you can see from the road right now, uh, the area on the right has yet to be formed. So it's quite nice to actually see it developing in front of my eyes over time. And so we're nearly done. I'm going to wrap you up with some conclusions. Just to say that the approach to coal mining has obviously changed um, over time. Can't be, no longer can be carried out without significant pre-planning and significant investment in advance to ensure that people know that you're going to return the site to a safe and um, environmentally friendly condition. Um, this means making a full inventory of the site in advance, listing the water features, the streams, evaluating the soil, the native plants, and checking which creatures have made their area their home. We know that in Australia, lizards have been taken out temporarily and brought back once mining is complete. And there's certainly a couple of coal mines in Ayrshire where the, the raptor, the, the bird community, are actually paid, uh, are actually watched by a paid um, watcher to ensure that they're not being negatively affected by mining in the area. And this is all changing the view of mining so that people see it no longer as a blot in the landscape, but now a sort of temporarily um, sort of interference to life, but at the end of it all, there will be some form of positive effect on the environment. And as we see things changing through time, I can tell you from the report that there's a definite move towards people leaving not just a completed site, but a site that has a positive benefit effect to the local community. Now, before I finish, um, I must warn you or advise you or recommend next month's um, webinar will be given by the very lovely Kyle Nicholl on developments in particulate control. That will be on Wednesday the 17th at 12 o'clock again. Now, I am quite happy to sit here for the next five minutes or so if you want to send me questions via the online system. Uh, apparently, they'll pop up in the bottom of my feed there. If not, please feel free to... Um, email me on at leslieflossetgmail.com. I really do um, answer all questions and emails. I'm pretty good at that. Um, and take a look at the report if you want more details. As I said at the beginning, I, I chose to present the prettiest pictures and the most interesting data, as it were. Um, but the report does contain an awful lot more detail with respect to legislation and so on. Oh. Oh, we have a question. Who is paying for St Ninian's? That is being paid for by Scottish Coal. Um, I think it's called uh, Scottish Resources Limited. They are paying for that um, um, themselves over the next couple of years, and they, they presume that they, they will probably get a little bit of funding from uh, Scottish Enterprise as well, since it's a legacy for the local community that they're making there. Uh, another question, are there still many old coal mines left? Yes, there are. There are hundreds of thousands of coal mines. I think in China, where there were a lot of smaller local coal mines, they literally have hundreds of thousands of abandoned mines, and there is a severe environmental problem where we still see um, areas of land collapsing and so on due to mismanagement of these regions. Um, and old mine, abandoned mines in Australia, in the UK, everywhere, it's a legacy that we see in any area that has mining in the past. However, it's important to note that, that because of the changing attitude, people are going back to these abandoned sites and improving them. Um, in places like Australia, uh, the UK, um, uh, Germany, most of Europe, I would imagine now, you, as part of the, the permitting scheme and that bond that you have to set aside, there's also a tax that's taken at the same time, and that goes into a fund for remediating abandoned mine sites. So... Um, money will be taken from them to go back and fix the mistakes of the, the industry in the past. Um, there, if you go online and I think Google um, mining reclamation funding, there are different agencies um, throughout Europe. There's something 
got a, a Q unit in, in Belgium, um, which works on brownfield sites. Um, there are plenty of people out there that are working to, to raise money and to go back and to make mining sites safer and more beautiful. Let's see if there's anything else on there. That's all the, the questions that have popped up for the moment. Um, and apparently I've only got 30 seconds left anyway. So I'll leave you with a big thank you for listening. I really do appreciate you having tuned in. And yes, genuinely, please email me at leslieslos at gmail.com if you would like any more questions or more information on the report itself. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, hang on. A question has popped up. Are studies available to decide whether it is better to let river water flow through mine voids or to isolate the voids and divert river course around newly created voids? Good question. There is, in fact, um, several models. I know there's a Chinese model and there's an American model that will determine whether or not it's a good idea to do exactly that, whether there is enough river water to dilute any um, any acid mine that might um, problems that might happen to the mine, or whether the, the, the natural water of course couldn't cope with the new releases of acidity and metals and so on, and so you would do that on a case by case basis. Um, again, the report has um, some details on the model systems that can solve, answer that question for you. Okay, you've all gone quiet on me. Must be time for a cup of coffee. No more questions coming in now. I'll see you so again. I'll re reiterate, I genuinely will reply to any email questions that you do have if you haven't had time to pop them online here. And thank you very much indeed for listening. Best wishes.